what I'd like to bring to you is uh, the fact that you have drug discovery, which can take drug discovery and preclinical. Preclinical, also called tox work, toxicology work. All of this can take anywhere in three to five years. Then there's the clinical trials after you file the IND. And again, I'm going through an overall drug development process on this slide, and then we'll go into details. Uh, the clinical trials, and I know everybody's aware of phase one, phase two, phase three, they can go anywhere between five to 10 years, uh, five, six to seven years, yes. It all depends on the field you're in. For oncology trials, they can be much sm uh, smaller, much shorter. Uh, companies would generally submit an NDA or a BLA, depending on if it's a small molecule or a biologic. And then uh, after the review, hopefully you get approval the first time, hopefully. But the approval rate for first time reviews and approvals is about, I think it's about 55 or 57 percent. The entire life cycle, as I said, can be anywhere between 10 to 15 years. We are hoping to bring that down to five years would be great. But I think uh, we'll hopefully get there one day. So uh, there are three submission mechanisms or three types of submissions, a 505J that are the genetics. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Genetics is everybody knows following patent expirations. You have genetics, which is abbreviated NDA. Genetics, uh, there are some constraints, have to be identical active, dosage form strength, route of administration, labeling, important, and performance. The other submission mechanism is 505B1, and this is the traditional NDA. It's a full NDA, a complete new drug application. And basically what you have is an application that has complete reports of safety, efficacy, or effectiveness, and quality. So you have, you demonstrate safety first by uh, doing preclinical work in different species. Uh, then you go into an IND, phase one, and volunteers. Nowadays you have phase 1A and phase 1B, and then you go into phase 2A, 2B. But basically a full NDA is basically you have, uh, for new chemical entities, studies that are conducted by the innovator, uh, and you require, or you have reports of non-clinical farm talks, clinical pharmacology of the drug substance uh, and the drug product. You have clinical investigations demonstrating safety and efficacy, and of course, CMC. Uh, that's my background, that's, I've been, uh, I have been over the past 20 years, been in product development and reg affairs, uh, majority of the time in CMC area, and then moved into clinical, non-clinical as well. So this was the second submission mechanism. The third submission mechanism is 505B2s, and that's what we are focusing on today. Uh, so what, what is a 505B2? So 505B2 basically is uh, intended to encourage innovation. Uh, it's intended to encourage innovation in drug development without requiring any duplicative studies. So it actually uh, enacted into law in 1984. So in past 29 years, uh, there's been a significant number of 505B2 applications that FDA has approved. Uh, I think the, the number goes in hundreds. And so basically what you have is a 505B2, you have, uh, you're avoiding any duplicate safety and efficacy studies of previously known information. And previously known information could be in literature, could be from uh, in FDA, uh, SBAs, or in other reports. So what you have to do, or what the companies do is, basically, uh, the applicant, or a FD, uh, 505B2 sponsor, 
would include reports of safety and effectiveness, where at least some of the information required is, is not conducted, and I think that's the important part. It's not conducted by or for the applicant, and for which the applicant does not have the right or has not obtained a right of reference. So meaning, uh, you could have product A approved by, say, Novartis, or company A, I should say. But a smaller company could take that product, improve it, and file a 505B2, improve it or have a different dosage form, have a different indication, have a different whatever, and we'll go through that. So that's a 505B2. But the, the small, the 505B2 sponsor does not, necess, does not have the right of reference. It's not a completely new product. Uh, there's no need to demonstrate bioequivalence because recall we talked about bioequivalence with 505B, uh, J, A, and D, A, S. So you do not need to demonstrate any bioequivalence. And we basically reference the non-clinical reports and clinical data. data. Uh, but you still need clinical data to support uh, any changes to the approved products. What are the business drivers? Why would companies want to look at 505B2s? So, as most of you are aware, as everybody is aware, there have been a significant number of patent uh, losses or patent expirations, I should say, between year 2010 through 2017. As you all know, about two years ago, uh, Lipitor, $7 billion product, lost patent. The, right after the patent was lost, it was flooded with genetics, and uh, the $7 billion compound went from $7 billion to, I think, a fraction of that. So significant losses. Uh, the, Today, as I understand, $120 billion loss in product revenues between 2010 through 2015. That's a significant number for the innovator companies. So uh, with that, we have to look at you know, what, are, what is it that companies can do to innovate, to be successful, to be able to file new drug applications, uh, with, with products that may be combination products or products where safety and efficacy have already Before been demonstrated. the generic industry uh, on by a the company industry. basis to sort of invest so when in you the have regulatory these science activity. B2 approvals, there is a three year period of exclusivity that's generally allowed. Uh, as long as clinical studies have been conducted by the applicant and there is also potential for five-year exclusivity um, for new chemical entities. Now, if you use the older active, then it's a three-year exclusivity. If it's a new chemical entity, five years. Orphan drug exclusivity is possible and pediatric exclusivity as well. Uh, I'm not going to go, I just wanted to give a few examples of 505B2s that have been approved. Zyrtec D, it's citrazine and pseudoephedrine. Zacuity, Duraclin, all of these are examples. I mean, you know, when I look at this list, I was thinking, wow, I didn't realize this is a 505B2. But there are hundreds of NDAs or 505B2 NDAs that have been approved over the, over the past two decades. Uh, this is just a very small list of those NDAs. So when I looked at all this, I said, okay, API stability studies, trust studies. Always you need those for 505B1s versus usually. These, there are some areas where I think we can rationalize, we can streamline development. This is one area where, you know, if, a, if an innovator has already demonstrated stability characterize the molecules, done MLT, uh, microbial limit test assays. Well, why do we typically need this information for, for the 505B2s? I would question that. In terms of streamlining the review and approval processes, I think I kind of partly covered non-clinical summaries 
uh, are included in module two of a submission. Non-clinical study reports are in module four. Some of this information I think is a repeat. Some of this information may not be warranted, but again, depending on the circumstance, if it's same route, same active, same dosage form, same uh, strength, I would uh, consider the need to question the value of this information because the more information you provide, if this information, again, as I, as I mentioned, if many of the items are same, same dosage form, same route of administration, same active, why would you want all of this information? Uh, so some of the work, I think there is duplication. Uh, in terms of streamlining, I think if FDA, uh, as industry is considering ways to shorten, doing things smarter, doing things better, doing things quicker, maybe the FDA should also consider, since they have already reviewed and approved, say, molecules that have been on the market, uh, for the 505B2, it's basically a different dosage form or different route of administration. Perhaps FDA should also consider shortening the review time because they've already seen this. It's nothing new, or I would hope it's not totally new information. It's a new dosage form, yes. But if the preclinical work has already been uh, shared with the FDA previously, uh, there's an opportunity for my colleagues at the FDA as well to say, all right, it's uh, maybe they should consider shortening the review times from a 10-month standard review to maybe a six-month.